Romans 7, we'll read the same passage as we did last Sunday evening in our consideration of grave robbers and Roman can candles. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law, notice to whom he's speaking now, to brothers, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she's married to another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband's dead, she's free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now the application in verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, notice again, speaking to brothers, you are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now notice that in this application of his illustration that Christ is both the first husband and the second husband. Christ after the flesh, the one spoken of in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15 as the last Adam, the one who summarizes the whole first creation. And he's the first husband, the last Adam, but he's also called in 1 Corinthians 15 the second man from heaven. And uh, that's very important. So in verse 4, my brethren, you become dead to the law by the body of Christ, by what we could call Christ after the flesh. And you might like to write in the margin there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17, and you'll find a verse in that section, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17, where it says, Though you've known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. God doesn't want us to know God Christ after the flesh anymore. And that's what we're talking about here in verse 4. Now, if you just get into the habit of asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten your spirit on this and not struggle to grasp it in the flesh, not simply try to think your way through it, but ask God to enlighten your inner being, then you begin to see new things. You find out that Jesus Christ is the great exclamation point at the end of God's first ruined creation, ruined by sin. John Milton wrote that great poem, Paradise Lost of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the universe and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain that blissful seat. And that's a very good summary of what we have here. So here you have Jesus Christ, the great exclamation point to the end of the first ruined creation. That affects you as a believer where you are day by day. It makes the difference about whether you penetrate through to new worlds or whether you stay locked up in carnality. There are only two options. We can either be spiritual Christians or we can be carnal Christians. And it has little to do with some of the standards that we lay down, some of the status symbols that we outline. It has everything to do with whether you live out of your spirit or whether you live out of your ego, whether you're, it's Christ within you or whether it's your independent self-effort, your flesh, and the whole thing is summarized for us here in a uh, rather weighty passage on the surface, but one that has great meaning. And so he says in the fourth verse, applying his illustration, you're become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now, there's only one way to get out from under the law, and that is by death and resurrection. You're become dead to the law. And furthermore, notice it's not something you do. It's something that has been done, except that you have to personally realize it and experience it through personal revelation. Because here he's telling us that we became dead to the law. Every believer was summarized in Jesus Christ, taken into union with him, brought into vital union with him, so that when Jesus died, he didn't die alone. The whole human race died in him. No one goes to hell because Adam sinned. People only go to hell because they choose to go there through rejecting God's remedy for sin. Jesus Christ solved the problem of Adamic sin by taking the whole human race into himself and dying. The book of Romans makes that very, very clear. That's one of the Roman candles that Paul lights here. And we have to think differently than we normally think in our three-dimensional, rational, ego-controlled mind. Because we don't usually think of being in someone else. And the great playwright, Henry Miller said, probably there's never been anything, and he's quoted by R.D. Lang in Lang's book, Facts of Life, probably there's never been anything but a womb, W-O-M-B, womb. Womb uh, is something that surrounds us, something out of which we're born. Now, we're not accustomed to thinking 
of being contained, but we're constantly contained. We can think of identifying with causes, we can think of identifying with groups like we're Americans and we identify with our flag and the rest of it, and there we can see a little bit of what it is to be part of a corporate man. But in a strange and wonderful way, when God looks at us, he does see us in our uniqueness. He most certainly sees us in our individuality. He calls us by our name in a way that nobody else on earth does because he says to those who overcome, he gives a white stone and in the white stone a new name written which no man knows, no other man knows, saving he that receives it. God puts a heavy, heavy premium on individuality, on your personal identity. But nevertheless, paradoxically, he sees us as one large man, one corporate man. And that's very important to the Christian to begin to get some illumination and some revelation on that point, because if he doesn't, he's going to be struggling to do what Jesus has already done. He's going to be working to do something that Jesus Christ has already accomplished. And uh, that's why Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And most Christians are working dreadfully hard at it. In fact, in, in that great conference that we had in the Statler Grand Ballroom in New York last month, a man came up after the first or second session and was just bubbling over, and he said, You know the greatest thing I heard in the message this morning? I said, What's that? And he said, Three words, take it easy. Take it easy. Well, Jesus said that. Come unto me, all you that are laboring and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, you can take his yoke in an instant of time, but learning's a lifelong process. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So as you look at this passage, ask God to give you an illumination on the fact that Jesus Christ is God's great exclamation point that summarizes the whole first creation in himself, and thus he's called in 1 Corinthians 15, the last Adam. And in this illustration, in our main passage here in Romans 7, we're seeing him as our first husband in Romans 7 and verse 4. So let's look at it in that mind that Jesus Christ takes us into himself. We're contained as we were once contained in the womb, so we're contained in the womb of humanity, of the first uh, humanity. And Jesus Christ takes the penalty for sin and the sins and the root of sin upon himself and totally identifies with the human race. Now this is the finished work of Jesus Christ for believers. And if you don't see this, you'll be working on a work that you think isn't finished. All right, verse 4. My brothers, you become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now Christ is the first husband, the one who died. How did we die to the law? Through the body of Christ. But notice that we're married to another. And who is our second husband? To the one who's raised from the dead. And who's that? Obviously the Lord Jesus. Why we're brought into union with him, so that we're in union with Jesus Christ as he's raised from the dead. When we're married, we come into union with our partner. And he's using that as a figure of speech here to declare to us that this is the way it is with the believer and with Jesus Christ. We're married to another, to him that's raised from the dead. Now, what should this do for the Christian? Well, the last part of verse 4 tells us what it does do for the Christian. We bring forth fruit unto God as a result of our union with the risen Christ. Now, if we don't realize that union, we will not be able to bring forth fruit. Now, that's just absolutely implied here and said absolutely point blank elsewhere. For example, in another analogy, he likens us to the uh, vine and the uh, uh, branches. And he says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And as the branch cannot, you are the branches, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to abide in the vine, neither can you, unless you draw your life from me, abide in me, and we'll puzzle and puzzle over that word abide, and really it's not very difficult when you think about it, because if you've ever been in the grape vineyard, the branches are not struggling to abide in the vine. They're just staying where they were created. They're just resting where they were created. They're part of the vine. They don't say, hey, I'm a branch and I've got to struggle to hang on. They just stay where they were created. And Jesus is saying to us, look, he, he probably walking through a, a grape vineyard with his disciples, and they certainly knew plenty about it, and said, I'm the vine, and you're the branches. And the branches will never have grapes hanging on them unless they abide in the vine. If they're cut off, they're henceforth good for nothing, be cast into a refuse heap and to be burned uh, like brush, brush fires in the spring. We used to trim through the grape vineyards uh, 
on the shores of Lake Erie when I was a boy, and then we'd get all the brush together and burn it. And uh, we'd usually do that, as my memory serves me, in the fall. And I always enjoyed working in the grape vineyard. But you know, all the branches did that remained was to abide in the vine, and the sap came flowing up through into the branches, and the fruit came automatically. That's what he's saying to us here. If you can come into a new relationship to Jesus Christ, if you realize what he's already done for you, that in the package of salvation, that in the finished work, Ephesians 2.10 is a great verse to write alongside of Romans 7.4. Ephesians 2.10, and most of us know it, I think. We are his workmanship. We are, get this please, his workmanship. And then a tremendous phrase. I am God's workmanship tonight. You're God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. How did I get in Jesus Christ? I was created in Jesus Christ. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Just like the branch is created in the mystery of growth in the vine, so I am created. So are you tonight. Herman and Erna and every person in this room that knows Jesus Christ is created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now I am in union with Jesus Christ, but I have to come to a conscious, free, willing, relationship to Jesus Christ and accept what he's done for me, the same as he died for my sins, but it didn't become active until I activated it by faith and acceptance. So God wants us to see that thing here tonight. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There's a place where I can rest tonight as a branch in the vine and be really me what God created me to be and the fruit will come as easily as it comes in the grape vineyard simply because the branches grow on the vine. And when the seasons pass over, eventually along about August, September, October, there in Erie, Pennsylvania, we used to go out and pick the grapes, and that was a lot of fun. It was usually an exhilarating time of year. And they certainly were beautifully sweet at that time of the year. And uh, you could fill up on those delicious grapes while they came in their season. And God promises the same thing to a Christian. If you'll simply abide in Him, yes, you will go through winter seasons. There will be a time when you won't have any leaves. There'll be a time when the snow will be hanging heavy on your branches. That's God's plan for your life. That's part of it. You can't be bearing fruit all the time. And that's why he tells us in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that chews the cud in the word of God day and night. Blessed is the man that meditates. Blessed is the man who has his vertical line open to God. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Another analogy. He'll bring forth fruit when? In his season. His leaf won't wither. Whatsoever he does will prosper. And so on. Now, abide in him and you'll bear fruit in your season. All right, look further here. Verse 5, a little switch here. When we were in the flesh, Romans 7, 5, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now, we'll look at that a little bit tonight in just a moment, but let's conclude by reading the sixth verse, because then he returns to that theme of being united, brought into union with a risen Christ, so that I can rest in him and I don't have to labor and struggle all the while to bear fruit because I will bear fruit in my season if I abide in him. And I'm married to another, to the risen Christ, so that I can bring forth fruit unto God. Now, verse 6 is rather a reiteration of that. So notice what he says in the sixth verse. Now we're delivered from the law. I didn't put that there tonight. There are Christians that just get very puzzled about this matter, and they think when you're teaching about being delivered from the law, you are certainly what we have historically referred to and labeled an antinomian. Namely, an anarchist, the spiritual moral anarchist, who wants people to go out and sin a whole bunch. In fact, I knocked my brother into a state of shock by asking him when I saw him in Vermont on this last trip. I was feeling very good that day. And I said, what, what favorite sins are you practicing right now? Well, he didn't know how to answer that question at all. Maybe you don't either. I'm not advising you to go out and practice your favorite sins. I don't have to because I know you'll do it anyway. Because that's part of being a sinner. Now, we need to really divest ourselves of some very strange ideas that come along with our ego minds. They seem very rational, and they seem very logical, and that's what's wrong with them. They appeal greatly to my natural way of thinking, the same as Abraham said, by George, I'm getting too old to have a son, and Sarah is barren, and so we'll bring in Hagar, and, and had the blessing of Sarah in the whole program, they brought in Hagar so they could have a child because they couldn't think their way through to fruit. And Christians do the same thing, and that happens to be why God tucked that in Hebrews and in Romans and in Galatians. He wanted us to get the message of our Father in faith that you can't think your way through to fruit. That what he's offering us is not rational, it's not logical, and the reason we don't like it and it's a terrible affront to us is that I can't control what's not rational. 
and I can't control what's not logical. If I can figure it out, then I can be in control, and that leaves ego sitting on the throne. I like that a whole bunch. That's what's wrong with it, is because it's doing what comes naturally. So Abraham couldn't think his way through to fruit, and so he said, well, if I'm getting too old to have a son, and God said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and he won't bless Eliezer, and I've been praying about that, then obviously there's one course of action left open to me. Logically, the only thing to do is to have another woman, and then I'll have a child by her, which he did, and then he spent the next 14 years after that, let me see, 85, yes, 14 years after that, praying, Lord, bless my program for fruit bearing. Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And he couldn't figure out why God wouldn't bless his logical program for fruit bearing. And then when every hope was gone, and the Bible says in Romans 4 uh, precisely that against hope he believed in hope, against hope he believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be, and be not weak in faith. He now, now mind you, don't put yourself down because you can't see what God might be speaking to us about tonight, neither could Abraham. It took a long unfolding process of time before he could see. It says in Romans 4, in the passage I'm right now quoting to you, against hope he believed in hope, that being not weak in faith. Well, he was plenty weak in faith until he was 99 years of age on that particular point. He couldn't figure it out how God could give him a son because he would be too old by the time he was almost 100 years of age. He thought he was too old by the time he was 85. And so they had Ishmael, the wild man, come into their home through Hagar, and, and it made great division in the home, and division to this day, thousands of years later, because he tried to think his way logically through to how God might do this thing. Now, don't try to think your way through to it. Ask God to bring you to the end of thinking, and I know that he will, because he'll bring circumstances into your life that will absolutely baffle you, as I mentioned last Sunday evening. He'll bring circumstances into your life that will stymie your natural mind. You won't be able to figure out where east is from west. And as Oswald Chambers, that great mystic and prophet of a bygone era, wrote in one of his books with an excellent title, you'll be baffled to fight better when the mind comes to the end of the string. And when we get to the end of our ego games, and we can no longer figure anything out, and our worlds collapse around us, because the beginning of all creative activity is the uh, dashing of what we're clinging to right now. The, uh, the whole beginning of the creative act, as Picasso said, is the destruction of the present uh, situation in which we find ourselves, where we're walled up in our Jerusalem. Now, Abraham tried to think his way through to fruitfulness and couldn't do it. Well, look at, look at what's told us here. In verse 6, we're delivered from the law. You, you say that, here Paul wrote that, and it's obviously true in the letter because it's been there in the Bible for 2,000 years now. And yet when Christians hear that, they many times get offended because they can't think their way through to that. They think that people become libertarians, antinomians, they're going to go off the deep end, they want to sin a lot. It's always struck me as very peculiar that we'd even adopt that logic. Because in the first place, there is hardly a person, if he doesn't want to live a really wicked life, but can accomplish that particular objective. Now just think about that tonight. If you want to look at this thing from the logical side, if a person really wants to live a wicked, licentious life, he can do it. And incidentally, if happiness came along with a wicked, licentious, libertarian life, this ought to be the happiest country on the face of this globe. The psychiatrist offices, the shrink's offices are filled to capacity. Why is that? Because when you start doing that, you run into stiff stone walls called laws. You can deny anything that's written. But you'll find out that the Bible tells us the truth, whether you read it or not, in Romans, the second chapter, when it says, of totally unsaved, unregenerate Gentiles, when the Gentiles, which have not the law. God did not give his law to the nations at large. He gave it to one specific small group of people, a small nation called Israel, off the top of Mount Sinai. He gave it as a covenant, and he gave it only to them. That's why Romans 6.14 says to Christians, you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the law, Romans 6.14. But under grace, God didn't give that to the church. He never even offered the covenant to the church. He offered it through Moses to Israel. And they signed up and they said, all that the Lord has said will do. But listen, how about the nations at large that never even got the opportunity to get that contract? Well, he says to those nations, when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. Does it mean simply because God never brought all the Gentiles to another mountain like Sinai and sent along a mediator of the covenant like Moses to give the law to the Gentiles that there are no uh, barriers, no parameters to a wicked licentious life? Listen, the Bible tells us precisely the opposite. It says, when the Gentiles, which have not the law, but they do by nature the things contained in the law, 
these having not the law or law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now C.S. Lewis came to Jesus Christ that way because he saw that there was a moral dictator within him that agreed with the external moral law. He claimed to be an agnostic, in fact an atheist, but he couldn't live that way because there was always a secret voice within him as a Gentile that said, you're not living up to a standard. He said, I noticed that there was no nation on earth where people, for example, were admired for pushing into line first when you had a long queue of people standing waiting to get into a particular place. He said nobody was ever admired for not playing fair. They'd say that's not fair. Well, he said there's an overriding universal moral statute. Well, you can read about it in his excellent book, Mere Christianity. That's how he came to Jesus Christ. He tells about it in his book, Surprised by Joy. Because what Romans 2 says is true. If you go out and live a wicked, licentious life, you're going to pay the penalty. God tells us that over and over again in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That's as sure as the sun rising and setting. That's as sure as any other law in the universe. Supposing tonight I, I start singing I'm free when I take off out of here in my Pontiac. And singing I'm free and I decide that by George I've been driving the speed limit too long. And tonight I'm going to drive 75 mile an hour through Melbourne. And I'm not going to pay any attention to stoplights or anything else because God set me free by George and I'm going to live free. And so I take off out of the church, spinning dirt up on the sidewalk, go bombing down a roar road through the stoplight, 75 mile an hour. How long do you think I'd get away with that? And I say, now I'm not going to diminish my speed a bit when I go around the corner. Even if a policeman didn't get me or if I didn't get killed at the stoplight, what would happen? I'd find out there's a law in the universe called the law of centrifugal force, which tends to throw objects out and away from the center when they're traveling at high speed, according to the physicists. That means I'd probably end up in somebody's front porch or in a ditch, or in a river, because you can't violate those laws and get away with it. Listen to what God says tonight, be not deceived, God isn't mocked, whatsoever a man sows, he'll reap. They that sow to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. They that sow to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And we're not going to be able to beat that game. You can go to Las Vegas once in a while and win. You can go to Reno and win. Or you can go over to Atlantic City, New Jersey, probably, and come home with a pocket full of change. But this is a game that nobody ever beats. This is a game that nobody ever wins at. He may seem to for a period of time, but eventually, someplace in God's eternal order, he'll reap the benefit of violating the law. Now then, what do we have to do to maintain society? Well, before we get back to Christian society, just go home and read what God has to say in Romans 13. Well, let, in fact, turn back to it. It's best to get it through the eye gate. Romans chapter 13. Now, you have a lot of folk, and we're all cut right out of the same cloth, and we think we can beat the game of sin. Jeremiah said, the heart of man is deceitful above all things. Deceitful. And it's most deceitful when it relates our own hearts to us. We, are, we live in great self-deception. This is part of being human. This is part of being born in Adam. This is part of that exclamation point that Jesus Christ took into himself. When he summarized the whole human race in himself, our hearts are deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, deceitful, how deceitful? Above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, the Bible said that for 2,000 years. And there are just about 99% of the things that Freud said that I don't agree with, but in this we're indebted to him. That at least long after the age of rationalism was in full swing, at least Freud came back and found out that man is a subject of determinism. And that he does, in fact, have a heart, which Freud labeled the unconscious and that it is desperately wicked. In fact, Freud took an absolutely dismal view of the human unco unconscious, that it was full of all kinds of ogres and dragon-like drives that made a person a pawn of his own psychology. Now, the Bible, in its negative passages, says something of the same. On the other hand, it says some very good things about the heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it come the issues of life. And Jesus said you can find treasure down there as well as dragons, and we preach that many times here. Now, however, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the Bible goes on to say in Jeremiah 17, only God can know it. It's so exceedingly wicked. Now, God knows all about it. You and I don't. He knows us inside out. But we have to live here in a society. What is God's provision for men living in a society? Time and again we read, and particularly back in the book of Genesis, about how men revolted against God and did every man did that which was right in his own eyes. He gave the institution of human government. So, here in Romans 13, notice what God has to say, we must preserve, and we heard a lot about this back in the Nixon era, law and order. 
And when you have wicked people with wicked hearts, as Freud said, with a wicked dragon-like unconscious, full of all kinds of creepy, crawly things, then you've got to have some controls. Now, God's given controls, and the control that he's given to society in order for society to even be possible is the institution of human government, and the Bible's as clear as a bell on that. And if you study the Bible dispensationally, there was a whole age of man given over to human government. So here in Romans 13, you have quite a dissertation on human government. It says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever resists the power resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves condemnation, or damnation, as the King James puts it. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou not then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you'll have praise of the same. Now he's talking about a general category of human government. He is not talking about it's absolutely wrong for a human being and a Christian ever to rise and revolt against an autocratic, tyrannical, authoritarian government. He never did say anything of the sort. If that were the case, we'd have to rip the book of Judges out of the Bible and throw it away because it's filled with insurrection against government. And so there have been time and time again in human history when people certainly ought to rise against authoritarian, tyrannical government. When Bonhoeffer, when he was plotting to remove Hitler through assassination if necessary, was doing what he felt God wanted him to do in his heart, and I'm not going to sit in judgment on him tonight. There are times to do that. But he's talking about a general category of human government. And he says in verse 4, that the ruler is a minister of God to thee for good. If you do that which is evil, be afraid. He bears not the sword in vain. Now, if you've got to have a radar detector sitting on your dashboard, and if you're constantly turning your head to and fro on the earth while you drive down the interstate because you don't have a radar detector, why do you think that is? Well, that's because there may be another guy behind a tree who also has a radar thing, but he's on the other end of it. And if you're going down the road, 61 mile an hour, and the speed limit is 55 mile an hour, It'll cause his machine to buzz, and there's no worse feeling that I know in the common, ordinary, humdrum run of life than to see the flashing blue lights behind you. It gives you an awful kick in the wallet. And there's just something very discouraging about the whole experience. It just does not make your day to see that. Some of you, I know, are looking a little bit guilty. Welcome to the club. Now, look what happens. He's a, he's a minister of God to thee for good. Remember this the next time you get stopped by a state trooper. He's a, or a town cop. He's a minister of God to thee for good. Won't that bless you? You say, welcome, pastor. I don't think you'll be saying that. You'll probably be trying to talk your way out of it with some of the best oratory known to humanity. But notice, he's a minister of God to thee for good. It says, if you do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bears not the sword in vain. And we might paraphrase that and bring it more up to date. He bears not his ticket book in vain. He's a minister of God, a revenger to execute, execute wrath upon him that does evil. So he must be subject, not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. Now, we don't need to read any more of that. The point is this, that because wicked hearts insist on living wickedly, and in rebellion, God gives the institution of human government, otherwise we'd live in anarchy. Nobody can abide chaos and anarchy. No nation can stand long with that kind of thing going on within its borders. And you have to have... Force. What keeps people in line? Force. What keeps them paying their taxes? Many of them. Because there's a threat that if they don't, they'll end up in jail or paying a very stiff fine or be embarrassed. And so it's force that keeps the unregenerate man in some degree of control so that society is possible where the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, gather up your mind, as Peter would say, gird up the loins of your mind, and come over with me to another subject. Here's the Christian church. I've been talking about pagan society. That's true of any of us living as citizens in Melbourne or Vermont or wherever you may live. Unregenerate or regenerate. That the policeman is there to keep law and order. Because our Adamic hearts want to break through those barriers, we think we can get away with it. So God gave the institution of human government. Now, come over to the Christian church. If the way to make Christians victorious is to keep them in line by intimidating force, what is the difference between the world with its gendarmes and policemen and the Christian church? And you don't have to be too bright to give the answer to that. There's no difference. If I still want to sin all I can and get away with it when I'm in a Christian church, there's something desperately wrong deep down in my spirit. I am wanting to please myself and pursue sin. There has been no change. 
What makes a Christian a different person? Because the governing disposition of his will has been changed. Now, he may be a worse polecat and a worse stinker than most unsaved people. He may have a worse behavior pattern sometimes than people who make no profession of knowing God at all, simply because he got saddled with a very bad disposition. And the Bible's full of people like that. And God works on them, and he works hard on them. But down in the deep engine room of their life, they want to please God, and they have a heart for God. Look at a stinker like David. David could plot and plan and scheme, and he could do everything under the sun. He could conspire to kill a man and commit adultery, but yet God called him a man after his own heart because he did have a heart for God. God looks on the heart. He looks at the deepest part of the inner being. Where is your heart tonight? Is it set on God? If it is, then you have a desire to please Him. Now, when people come into the Christian church, most assuredly, they need to be taught where those boundaries, lines are. They know it anyway in their heart, but it's reflected back to them. But God doesn't intend that we should stall there, because it takes some time to get this thing cranked up to grow. God wants us to penetrate into another new dimension entirely, which transcends that kind of thing, which lifts us above, so that we become eagle saints and are able to soar according to entirely different laws. By setting our wings, we're able to float on the currents of God's heavenly provision, and we're in a new place and a new position. We're raised up with Jesus Christ to bring forth fruit unto God, and we want to bring forth fruit unto Him. We do not have to be kept in place by the intimidating force of moral authority, which is always uh, a very ludicrous thing anyway. It's, uh, it's a piece of chicanery because there's always all kinds of hypocrisy that goes on behind the screen, and we simply are not able uh, to do it. And so we need to come to the place where we let Christ do it in and through us. So now, notice verse 6. Now we're delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. Now what does this phrase mean? Newness of spirit. Not in oldness of the letter. Now, I get saved and I come out of that pagan society where the policeman has to keep me in line. Come over into the Christian church and I begin to learn the rudimentaries and the basics of Christianity. I get the foundations laid and the rest of it. That's all fine. But God wants me to internalize the law so that a different kind and quality of life is flowing out through me. It is not a question of right and wrong. It's a question of life and death. Man's worst sins are not that he commits adultery or that he murders his fellow man. If God were to categorize sin, he always categorized pride and hubris as the top sin. The devil said five times, according to the Old Testament, I will be like God, I will ascend, I will put my uh, throne above the stars of God and so on. I will, self-will, independent will, ego, mind, ascending to the throne of the universe. I will be my own God. And he peddled the disease to mankind. That's the worst sin. Ye shall be as gods. And God can't be trusted. A twofold sin, vertical and horizontal. You can't trust God. God knows that in the day you violate his law, he can't be trusted. He hasn't put this law on you, this prohibition. He hasn't laid that boundary there for your good. Put him up to a heavy suspicion. There's good behind breaking through that barrier. He knows that in the day you eat of that tree, you'll be like he is. You'll have knowledge of good and evil. And so man wanted the knowledge of good and evil, and by George, he got it by rebellion. And from that day until this, he's been writing great canons and categories and moral authorities on what's right and what's wrong. It's never been a question of what's right and what's wrong. That solves absolutely nothing. Because the fact is, we're only able to do the wrong and not able to perform the right. It's a question of life or death. It's not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's the tree of life that we need. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the first Adam. The tree of life is the second man from heaven. We need a new quality of life flowing through us. We need that life that rose from the dead. I am married to another husband who's raised from the dead so that I can bring forth fruit unto God. As long as I live in doing what comes naturally, thinking what comes naturally, then I'm never going to see that. Come back to Roman, or, uh, the 8th chapter, please. Here he's speaking to believers. This is the great chapter on the Holy Spirit, where he's mentioned 19 times. Let the Lord write this in your heart, in verse 5. They that are after the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. Now, what would have happened had Jesus Christ never come and died for me? You know what would have happened if he'd never died for you or for me? Would we have done a little good? No. Relatively, in our own context, we would have done a little good, yes, but from God's standpoint, nothing but pure evil. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whoso offends in one point is guilty of the whole thing. Now, I didn't write that. God put it in, in James. 
Whoso offendeth in one point is guilty of all. God says, look, don't try to build yourself up by comparing yourselves among yourselves and measuring yourself by yourselves, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians. You're not wise to compare yourselves among yourselves or measure yourselves by yourselves. We're experts at that. If Jesus had never died for us, we would have belonged to category one. We would have belonged to Adam one. We would have belonged to that Adam in whom we were all created and through his disobedience been made total, absolute, pure, abject sinners without any capacity for doing good except relatively among ourselves. But God says, by my standard, that's no standard at all. He says, by my standard, the standards you have are nothing. I'm of two pure eyes to behold iniquity. Whoso offends in one point is guilty of the whole thing. And he, so he says to every one of us, regenerate and unregenerate, though Paul wrote it to Christians, if you compare yourselves among yourselves, measure yourselves by yourselves, you're not wise. That's self-righteousness. It's just that we can always find somebody who's in worse shape than we are and say, thank God I'm not as that person is. Well, God reserved his most scathing in indictment for that great religious doctor who did that precise thing in the temple. Thank God I'm not like that publican. And God said the publican who beat on his breast and recognized that he was a sinner and had fallen short and his show was over, that man went down to his house justified, whereas the Pharisee went out under condemnation. Why? Because he lived in system one, in category one, in self-righteousness. He was trying to fix up something that God said could never be fixed up. God told Adam, in the day you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not going to get worse little by little. You're going to just plain die. The one single sentence on the first Adam is death, and nothing but death will fulfill the bill. Now look at Romans 8 and verse 5, and it says, They that are after the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Here are two possibilities. There's a hole in the ceiling open to the Christian. He comes into the Christian church. God says, I've renewed your spirit. I've given you a new capacity. I've given you a new resonator. You can pick up the vibrations which come from my heart. My spirit will bear witness with your spirit, as he says later on in this very chapter, in the 14th through the 17th verses. And he said, you'll be able to be led by me. I'll write my laws in the fleshy tables of your heart. I'll guide you. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying this is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. I'll minister life to you. It's a matter of life. If you've been justified through my death, if you Christians, Romans 5, have been justified and become Christians because I died for you, you'll much more be saved through my life. Not through moral categories, not through rules, not through relics, but through my life, through the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. So he says there's an option open to you. There's a hole in the ceiling. You can walk after the Spirit. You can have a whole new motivation. You can have a whole new power, new energy. You can see the old life canceled out at the cross. That's what the cross is, the end of human effort. Independent human ego effort comes to an end. It's the place where we can't figure it out anymore. It's the place where our reputations come crashing down, where our world becomes chaotic, and all of a sudden we have to look up and find order and meaning from a new dimension entirely from our spirit. And so he says, they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse 6, Romans 8, to be carnally minded is death. To be naturally minded is death. Oh, that we can let that sink in tonight. If I'm going to have a Christian life where I figure everything out from center to circumference, and I've got my world in order, and by George, I'm sitting right up there on top of my little pinnacle on top of the mountain, and I've climbed up there in my self-righteousness, and I've got a pretty good idea that I've got an answer to everything, and no surprises are going to overtake me because I've got my world ordered. That's the very time when God pulls the rug right out from under Christians. That's the precise time when our worlds come crashing down. That's exactly the time when Jesus Christ disappointed his disciples. When they said, we thought he would have delivered Israel, and this is the third day, and he died. Instead of becoming a deliverer, he disappointed us, and he died. And we thought he'd deliver Israel, and were pursued by the Roman authorities, and he's dead. And they didn't know that he was coming right into them and into their midst as they walked down to that Emmaus road and said that to him. If you're going to try and figure out everything, you never want to embrace the Christian life. You never want to make that all once for all surrender that Romans 12, 1 says, where I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God. In the Greek it says that you once for all present your bodies a living sacrifice. Because you're going to find that that's a robust life where you're not in control because the difference between the tree of knowledge of good and evil 
and the tree of life is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil creates the illusion illusion because it's never anything but a total devilish satanic demonic illusion of control the tree of life is the way of surrender that's the way of the cross those trees are set before us as Christians now he says to be carnally minded is death to be spiritually minded is life and peace but I'm very interested in that next verse because the carnal mind thinking naturally and this is what I've been preaching up a storm on tonight the natural mind is at enmity with God it is not subject to God's law it never can be what in the world does he mean by that here's a Christian who to all intents and purposes consciously in his conscious mind wants to please God he really does now we're going to assume that tonight why does God hand him this irrational insult in verse 7 where he says in a chapter full of the Holy Spirit where he's mentioned 19 times I believe in Romans the 8th chapter the carnal mind is enmity against God it is not subject to the law of God that's not written to the unbeliever that's written to the Christian it is not subject to God's law and it never can be and he concludes by saying in verse 8 they that are in the flesh can't please God if you're going to live what comes naturally you're going to think what comes naturally you can't please God well why not supposing I have a great sincere desire to please God and I say well I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to live in obedience to God now that's that's a good intention God gave Israel good intentions when he handed them that covenant you see they were already his people unconditionally his people now you think with me when they came to Mount Sinai they were unconditionally his people he had told Moses to go to Egypt when they were in bondage and hopeless and he said you preach the good news to them and Hebrews 4 calls it the gospel and he said you say I have seen the affliction of my people why are they his people because they came from the line of Abraham Isaac and Jacob God chose them from before the foundation of the world he said I have seen the affliction of my people they've been down there four centuries by that time 400 years and they're now under hard taskmastership from Pharaoh and he said you preach this good news to them I have seen the affliction of my people they didn't know God from the hole in the ground when Moses went to preach that I've seen the affliction of my people. I am come down to deliver them out of Egypt and to bring them into a land that flows with milk and honey. Every place the sole of their foot treads on, I have given to them. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You've got a gift from God tonight. But do you know what's in the package? You know, many a Christian has been saved 25, 30, 45 years, and the only thing they know in the passage is that they were saved from the wrath of God and they're not going to hell, and that's all they know 40 years later, in essence. Do you know what's in the package tonight? God has also put in that package that he not only brings you out of Egypt, he brings you into fullness of life. I am come that you might have life out of Egypt and have it more abundantly into Canaan. Have you entered into that side of the package? It's just as much a gift as the first half. The indwelling Christ is as much a gift as the saving Christ. I was reconciled to God by the death of his son. I'll be saved by his life. But many a Christian has never seen that's part of his finished work. And so what does the new and well-intentioned believer do? He does the same thing. He repeats the historic error. It comes naturally to him. That's why he repeats it. We can't produce a generation of Christians that will never repeat the error because it's natural. Every single believer has to go through it to experience it. So it's written in his heart. You can't produce a generation of Christians to say, I'm going to stop trying because the greatest hit heresy in the Christian church, as Charles Trumbull used to say, is the heresy of Christians trying to live the Christian life. So I'm not going to try anymore. Trying is natural. The natural mind is an enmity with God. How will I ever be brought to the place where I'll stop my perverse habit of trying to control through what I know and be able to surrender and let Christ do it through me? The only way I'll do it is be by being brought through circumstances and experiences and tribulations and tests that'll cause me to lose confidence in my flesh, that'll cause me to lose confidence in my ability to control so that I'll see I am not God in the center of the universe. That's an unconscious lie that's buried in the depths of our heart. That's what makes us incredibly wicked, is that we think in our deepest heart that we're God. It's Satan's lie, stamped in category one, system one, the first Adam. And it takes God's fire to burn it out, and to turn on Roman candles and new lights, to the fact that we should not go back to the grave and seek to rob the grave of his first Adam where God buried him. God put the sentence of death on that thing. He wants us to live by new lights and enter into the fact that we're married to him who's raised from the dead so that we can bring forth fruit unto God. But here I am in my good intentions. I want to please God. I'm born again. That's a noble intention. So that when Israel was saved out of Egypt like young Christians, when they came to Mount Sinai and God said, 
you tell the people what I've said, Moses. And he went down and told the people what God had said. Do you know what Israel answered? You go back and read Exodus 19 and 20 and Deuteronomy 5, and you'll see I'm telling you the truth. He, they responded, they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Now, they thought they could. They had good intentions. In fact, God gave them credit for good intentions. He said the people have well spoken that which they've spoken. He was glad that they wanted to please him. But immediately in Deuteronomy 5, God said to Moses, they won't be able to do it. And his very words were, Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would keep my commandments. But I know, paraphrase, a whole lot more about them than they know about themselves. And that's true of you and me, too. Now, what's God want to teach us through this thing? Well, look back here at Romans 2. How do I find out that my natural way of thinking is at enmity with God? I think that the way to teach myself to behave is by giving myself standards and rules, and then I can begin to compare myself and measure myself by my peers and other people. Well, that's precisely the system that Paul said, naughty, naughty to. He said, look, friends, when he wrote from a Roman jail in the end of his ministry to the church at Philippi in the third chapter of that letter, he said, I do not want that kind of righteousness. I do not want to, I want to be found in Christ. I want to be found in union with my second husband who's raised from the dead. I don't want to be having my own righteousness, which is the law. But I want to be found in him not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness rather that comes from God through the tree of life by faith. Well, you know, it's one thing to hear that. It's another thing to experience it. That's what the whole Christian walk is about. That's what the way of the cross is about. And so when Paul begins to reason with his own Jewish countrymen in New Testament days, look what he says to them. He wants them to learn this lesson as well. Verse 17, Romans 2. Behold, thou art called a Jew. Now, what are your points of pride? What are your status symbols? What do you trust in? Upon what is your faith resting? You are called a Jew, Paul's saying, to his contemporaries, to his countrymen. You're called a Jew. We could paraphrase and say you're called a Christian. Now, the status symbols are a little bit different. But notice that the philosophy is precisely the same. What are you? You're a Jew. What are you trusting in? What are you resting on? The law. Now notice Paul's devastating, powerful attack on that concept. You make your boast of God. You say you're God's people. Verse 18. You know His will. You approve things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. You're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. Not only were they God's people, they were a light to the world. They thought of themselves as a light in a dark place. Jewish nation still feels that way, that they have a messianic mission to the world. And that's the way those Jews felt about it. Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and truth in the law. But here comes the punchline in verse 21, and it comes to Christians tonight. Here's the punchline for you. Here's the punchline for me. Thou, therefore, that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that... Oh, now, just let this sink in tonight. Thou that teachest another, don't you teach yourself? You that preach that a man shouldn't steal. Do you steal? You know, it's incredible, our blindness. I forget which one it was, Oedipus or somebody in Greek mythology, that because he couldn't face the truth, put his eyes out. He inflicted blindness on himself. What a powerful symbol that is. How many times do we do that? When we can't face the truth, we willfully, deliberately, make ourselves blind. When the truth is too powerful to face, and it means the destruction of our present mode of being, as I read from Teilhard de Chardin last Sunday night, that if we're going to grow, we're going to have to forsake one mode of being after another. We're going to have to leave the cocoon behind. We're going to have to shed the snake skin. We're going to have to move on with God. Well, that's a very threatening thing. That's what the cross is all about. It's the place where reputation crashes. It's the place where natural reasoning comes to an end. It's the place where irrationality takes over. And the surprising, the vague, and the exceptional, and the enigmatic must be faced. And a person as a creative Christian has to pass through chaos. So the punchline from Paul, from the Holy Spirit, thou that teachest that a man shouldn't steal. Well, you know, it's possible to steal for years. It's possible to steal all kinds of things for years and pride ourselves in the fact that we've never stolen one thing. And yet the day may come when God will say, look, you shaded that in your income tax. You shaded that when you cheated on the parking meter. You did this, you did that. And all of a sudden something happens. We've been doing that for years and our conscience didn't bother us very much about it because the conscience is a very imperfect instrument. But then God speaks to us one day, and we find out that His perfect standard is a whole lot 
higher than ours, and we say, good heavens, that's right, I have been doing that. And we can't stand the truth of that thing. Well, there are all kinds of options to opt out of that painful experience, at least to repress and dull the pain. One is that you can escape from that kind of a face down with truth. You can run out and do what we usually do, the most pervasive psychological device known to humanity, is projection. And we go around and attack other people who are guilty of that. We're trying to get rid of it out of our inner being by plastering it on somebody else. And it comes to us as a reflex action. We unconsciously hate certain things in ourselves, and so we see them reflected in the mirrors of people who have the same problem or whom we perceive to have the same problem around us. If we feel down deep in our being that we're as proud and arrogant and cocky and self-assured as any person who ever came up the pike, we may be able to deceive our friends around us. We may be able to put on a nice plastic smile. We may be able even to put on a humble countenance and say, look how humble I am. But down deep inside, we know that that's not true because our heart, that dragon, keeps pounding on the cellar doors you've heard me talk about before. And it keeps saying, here I am and I'm part of you. You're full of pride and that's the truth. You're arrogant and you're cock sure, uh, confident and you think that you can run your own show. And we're saying, no, 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 because that's contrary to my conscious ethics. I cannot admit that. Too painful to admit that. And so we go around and we pick out this case or that case or another case or several cases and we say I'll get rid of this it's unconscious reflex action by plastering it out on somebody else by puking it out on somebody else and so we project our problems onto others and so great brilliant minds like R.D. Lang write strange books in which they describe us books like knots K-N-O-T-S tied in knots our relationships become so muddled and so cloudy that we never see a real person. Everybody's projecting, everybody's holding up fig leaves like Adam and Eve because they can't face the painful truth. And you meet all these distortions and fantasies and projections out there instead of real people because we could never admit the truth. What would the real truth mean? It would mean death to our present mode of being. So Paul gives these painful punchlines. I used to wonder how under the sun did Paul manage to get himself in so much hot water? I don't uh, wonder anymore, because everything that he preached was absolutely an offense, as he himself said. The cross is to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Everything that he preached was a threat and an offense to natural control and natural reason. He was absolutely determined through the abundance of revelations that God gave him to bring the kingdom of self to full exposure. So he did that by asking painful questions, like those in verses 22 there. Thou that sayest a man shouldn't commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Well, do you? That's what he's saying. You say, oh no, not me, I've never been guilty of that dreadful sin. Well, good, if you've been kept from the overt act, praise God, that's something to rejoice in, I'm glad. At least you don't have to bear the trauma and the guilt of having committed adultery. But, my dear friends, take a good look at the verse. Paul is assuming that everybody who honestly answers that question is going to have to answer it in the affirmative. Why does he assume that they're going to have to answer it in the affirmative? Because Jesus amplified the law and put it back in his proper perspective when he said, Look, it hath been said of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, Whosoever looketh the lust hath already committed adultery. Well, now that's a horse of a different color. And there's not a person who isn't guilty on that basis. He may deceive himself and think he isn't, the rest of it. But if he ever has a face-to-face -face confrontation with God's light, he'll understand that he has. And so he's assuming that the only honest answer to that question can be an affirmative answer. He said, you're around teaching others about these things. How about yourself? Do you commit adultery? You that say don't steal, do you steal? Notice he just goes on asking these embarrassing questions. You that abhor idols, do you commit sacrilege? Verse 23. You that make your boast to the law. Now you boast about the law and about your standards and about your morality and what a stand you take for truth. Do you break the law and dishonor God? Paul's asking his contemporary Jews. Do you break the law and dishonor God? Now you know that I'm not telling tales out of school when I say that time and time again you'll hear the unfortunate story come back. Listen from painful experience from brothers in Christ and from those outside of Christ. <clears throat> Don't try to talk to me about the way Christians handle their business. So and so did this to me. He took me to the cleaners like no one that ever made any profession of God whatsoever. 
The Jews didn't have any corner on this. We Christians have been well acquainted with this kind of behavior. Hypocritical behavior. Hupokrites, the wearing of a mask. Now we don't like to face these painful things. They hurt. Why did God put them in the Bible? Because he wanted to heal us and bring us to a better way. But he couldn't do it while we were locked up in our illusions any more than he could bless Abraham with a son while Abraham could only think in three dimensions and say, I'm getting too old, I'm getting too old, like a broken record. Unless I do something about this, nothing will ever be done. I'm getting too old. And so he did something about it and brought confusion and chaos when he created Ishmael. And then he found out after he got clear to the end of his string, hoping against hope, then he wasn't weak in faith anymore, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, God was able to perform, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and a son was born unto him. Impossible through natural thinking, nat natural physiology, natural gynecology, a son was born to him at a hundred years of age. It became the joy of his home, and he named him Laughter, Isaac. Well, that's what God wants to teach us over and over again, and we learn very slowly. Notice how he concludes this. He says, verse 23, Romans 2, You that make the most of the law through breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Now, he said, don't glory in the fact that you're a circumcised people. That was a big deal in those days. With Christians, many times, we're baptized people. He said, don't glory in these symbols. It profits if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision, your baptism is made uncircumcision, unbaptism. Don't be boasting about your church membership and the rest of it. He said, where's reality? I'll come back to Romans 7. We'll conclude in these closing moments on this. How did Paul find this out? <clears throat> How do I find out that the natural mind's at enmity with God? I find it out through bitter experience. Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is there anything wrong with God's law? No. God forbid. I had not known sin but by the law. Now why did God give the law? He gave the law not so that you'd have a guideline to do the best you could by. He did not give the law so that you'd have a barometer upon which you could measure your spiritual weather. He did not give the law as a yardstick so that you'd know how high you had climbed in the kingdom by obeying certain commandments. The Bible sings the old well-known tune over and over again. He gave the law, as the fourth and fifth chapters of Romans tell us, to multiply transgressions, to make people sin more than ever. Now, I didn't write that. God wrote that. What is this business of serving in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter? If you're going to serve in oldness of the letter, your natural mind will tell you, look, I do want a yardstick upon which I can measure myself. I used to smoke, now I don't smoke anymore. Well, I don't think you ought to smoke if you want a uh, personal opinion, which is only that, and it's a personal opinion. And most especially, you ought not to be hooked on cigarettes. But look, my friend, there may be a time in your life when you'll find that that's absolutely essential. Do you want somebody who is as big as a Goodyear blimp turning around and saying to you, Thou shalt not smoke? Now that makes for a certain oppressive environment. You see, those are the things that really start treading on toes. That's where we love to be liars. Where we just enjoy living by our illusions. Because if I'm going to live by my natural mind, and I'm going to live by a yardstick, and God never intended the law to be a yardstick of my spirituality. He intended the law to destroy me right down to the soles of my feet. He intended the law to bring me into contact roughly, crudely, in huge shocks, with what I really am in my natural being. But I run around self-deception because ego. What's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of flesh? In the kingdom of flesh, ego reigns in the illusion that he's God. In the kingdom of God, spirit, Jesus Christ, the indwelling Christ, the true self, reigns. 
and ego is in a subservient position. I have been crucified. Ego has been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, ego still lives, yet not doing the living. Christ is living in and through. Ego is based on a new foundation, the indwelling Christ. We learn that little by little. My dad used to say, steady by jerks, but we grow. We grow. We learn how to surrender a little better. Look, if you walk with God 40, 45, 50 years, you're going to find out that God, the closer you get to Him, you're going to find out that ego is holed up in this demand to be independent and to reign and to compete and to win and to oppress and to put down. I must be at the top of the heap. You're going to find that holed up in portions of your personality where you never suspected it was holed up. But we camp around Mount Sinai. We do what Israel did. We get stalled in the wilderness. And we say, well, now the law is my spiritual yardstick. So by George, I've quit smoking. I'm a better person. I've now stopped smoking. And most certainly better than Jane over there, she still smokes. And uh, I'm a temperate person. What, the, what does that mean? I don't have a still in my backyard. What do you think it means? I don't touch a drop. Yes, but one look in the mirror or one look at oneself say that there's great difficulty with the push-away muscles. Or you push yourself away from the table at the right time. So here's a person killing themselves with obesity and intemperance. Oh, you say, yeah, you miss me completely. Look, I'm not trying to hit you tonight. That's the part of the Holy Spirit to do. He hits me plenty when I'm preaching these things. He's talking to all of us about these things. But you'll say, well, anyhow, you didn't tread on my favorite sin. Well, I'm not here to tread on your favorite sin tonight. But you might say, well, praise God, I'm going right up that yardstick. I'm not overweight, at least not very much. And I don't smoke. Whoopaloo You're looking at a victorious person. But here's a guy that all you have to do is hold up a golf ball. And he gets a wild look in his eye and he runs straight to the links. And he's like that fellow that came home and told his wife he was late getting home that night because of Harry, who had been playing golf. You probably heard that story. She said, what do you mean you've always got some ridiculous excuse you never spend any time with me? He said, well, when we were playing the first hole, Harry died of a heart attack. And he said it was hit the ball and drag Harry the rest of the game. <laughs> What's your idol? What's your God? It can be anything. What's your point of intemperance? The swimming pool? The theater? The newspaper? It can be anything under the sun. But when we begin to let natural mind and rational thinking, our little puny ego mind, where ego reigns and rules through things it can figure out, we greatly reduce all of God's standards to the ones we particularly like that can give us a little sense of a feeling of discipline, of mastery, of self-control, and then we use it as a huge drum, like kettle drums, upon which to beat the tune of selfhood and a tremendous victory, I have done this. We may add, attach the name of Jesus Christ to it. That's what's particularly vicious about the whole thing, is that we'll say, look at all these things I've done, and we sit there and hit these things like kettle drums and say, I've kept all these rules, therefore I must be better. And everybody can smell the phonyism of that kind of thing. And the world can smell the phonyism of that kind of thing. And Christ could smell the phonyism of it. Because there's only one kind of people on this planet. He said, I never gave the law as a yardstick to find out how well you're doing. He said, I gave the law to destroy you right down to your socks and then to burn the socks off. <laughs> well, how'd Paul find that out? Well, look how he found it out, and we'll conclude rapidly here in the next two hours. In verse 15. I'm getting very warm up here, so I'll draw it to a close. But notice how he found this out. Now, he's a believer, and here's a page out of his diary. This page is filled with more ego. You know, the Greek word for I is ego. I, I, I. This has more personal pronouns in it than any other passage of Scripture, save one in Isaiah, and there the personal pronoun is applied to God. But here it's applied to ego. So here's Paul, who is alive without the law. And he knows God. And he's speaking to believers about their relationship to the law. And he tells them there's no way you're ever going to escape from this devastating condemnation. In other words, you can live a life full of sin and hypocrisy. 
loaded with guilt, or you can live a life of freedom by walking in the Spirit. You can either do what comes naturally and try to figure it all out and think it all through, or else you can take the hole in the ceiling route through the Spirit, and I've got a new way to serve, not in oldness of the letter. Not what your mind thinks about the letter of the law and how you'd like to use it as the yardstick for your own progressive advancement, but I've got something better for you, namely we'll serve in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Verse 6, we read that earlier tonight. Now how did Paul personally find that out? He found that out by painful, bitter experience. Verse 15, what I do, I allow not. What I would, what I would, I can't do. I hate the thing that I do. What I hate, that's the thing I find myself doing. Have you ever found that out? Now here's a Christian chugging along and he's feeling really great because he's keeping all the rules of his peer group. And he's congratulating himself in his deep con unconscious part, in his subconscious, and saying, boy, I'm doing all right, because he's comparing himself with somebody else and measuring himself by others, and so he's doing better than some and he's feeling good. But he's got a desire to please God. Now, he really does want to please God, as we read earlier, and he really wants to get through to God. And so one day he's reading the scriptures, and here he doesn't smoke, chew, drink, swear, go to the theater or the dance, and he wears subdued clothing, and, and parts his hair in the middle and plasters it down with goose grease. He looks good. He looks like he should in that particular peer group. And so he says, I'm doing fine, but he's reading his Bible one day, and he's an honest man. Now, it's a terrible thing to read your Bible and have an honest heart. Because when he's reading his Bible one day, he reads in Matthew, or Mark rather, let's say in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any. For if you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. You want a standard to live by, live by that one. And he thinks of someone who did him dirt. Now, how many of you tonight have had somebody has done you dirt at one time or another? Think of the person you hate the worst. <laughs> oh, you say, dear brother, I hate no one. All right, good. And then don't think about anybody. But anyway, for those who are sinners, you think of the one you hate the worst. You're reading your Bible one day, and God says, when you stand praying, forgive Harold. Forgive Joe. Forgive whoever that person is. Forgive Sarah. Because if you don't forgive, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Now, you've got your standard, and you're doing the best you can to please God. And you say, all right, Lord, they really did me a rotten one, and boy, you can feel the old fireball coming up when you think about it. But I'm going to be magnanimous, I'm going to be gracious, and you pray up a storm and you forgive them right on the spot. Beautiful. You get up and mop your brow with your bandana and you walk off rejoicing in a great signal spiritual victory. You've climbed new heights. So maybe a day or two or a couple hours or a couple weeks later you're driving down the street and all of a sudden that person's name comes into your focus up from your unconscious and all of a sudden great red, red lights go on again. And you find out that the old monster of hatred comes bombing right up out of the unconscious again. And you have a tremendous struggle all over again. So this time you say to God, now you know I tried to forgive them and I thought I had it made, now help me. And so you pray like mad. You think you got the victory over it, and you go out, and lo and behold, you have the same experience again and again, and you pray harder, God, help me, help me, help me conquer this sin of unforgiveness. Like one man said to me down in Sabinsville, Pennsylvania, years ago, his big thing was cigarettes, and he held up a cigarette to me, and he said, if only I could get rid of that, I'd be a perfect man. <laughs> Well, God zeroes in on some particular sin. I may not have mentioned yours tonight. I don't have to. It's not my business. That's the Holy Spirit's business. And He won't do it until the time is ripe either. But let's say it's forgiveness. And so now you've been praying and you've been trying hard and you've been struggling. You've been working up a sweat and man, you're really concerned about this thing. You've been asking God to help. And finally you say, doggone it, I'm exhausting myself. I'm trying to forgive. I can't get over this. I've got this bad feeling. And then you start feeling angry at God because He's not giving you any help. He seems to be sitting up there knitting in His rocking chair instead of helping you. And so, if you're in certain groups, that's very difficult. If you're in certain types of groups where you can't express how you really feel on the inside, that's really tough. 
Because then you got mad at God, and that's definitely one of the no-nos. And so you say, uh, the Holy Spirit says, Say, aren't you been angry at me? Oh, no, 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 certainly not. And so we smile, and steam's coming out our ears. And so now, all of a sudden, it occurs to us that we've lied to the Holy Spirit about this. Not only are we unforgiving, we're mad at God, and we've lied. Why, sin's beginning to multiply. Good heavens. I was fighting with one sin to begin with, now I'm fighting with three. And it gets worse as you go on, and they're multiplying all over the place, and the harder you try, the more you fall. Did I make that up? No, I experienced it, but I didn't make it up. I've experienced it many times. Paul experienced it. Look what happened to him. Verse eight, 18. And you know what we can't do when we're in the middle of this thing? It, you know what makes it so painful? is because we can't admit we're not perfect. That would mean that we're no longer God if we're not perfect. We can't possibly accept a spot and blemish in our sterling character. We're the beautiful people because we've kept the yardstick. We're the keepers of the yardstick, by George. How could we have a blemish? I mean, if I admit it as a keeper of the yardstick with my group that I had this kind of blemish, they wouldn't let me keep the yardstick anymore. I'd be an outcast. Well, look at what old Paul found out. Verse 18, he's, he's learned a lot of lessons here. He says, I know that in me, that is my natural makeup. Don't think of the flesh as some third party. It's just you and me, the way we were born from mom and daddy, naturally. There dwells no good thing. My, he's getting a discovery there. Now, if he were really convinced of that, he wouldn't struggle. You know that? If he were really convinced that in him there were no good thing, he would not struggle anymore. But the chapter goes on and the page out of his diary goes on because he's lying some more. He can say with his lips and believe to a degree in his mind, I don't believe that in me there's any good thing, but he doesn't really believe that at all. I know that in me there dwells no good thing. Now, does he want to please God? Yes, he does want to please God. The will is present with me. What's missing? H-O-W. I don't know how many I suppose that I could say now. Yes, I think I can say over these 25 years, thousands of people in all the conferences and everything have said in essence in different terminology that same thing. All my life I have heard what I ought to be, but nobody ever told me how to be what I ought to be. I want to please God, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Verse 19, the good that I would I do not, the evil which I would not, I find myself doing that. What a tangle foot this is. It's even difficult to read aloud. Now, if I do that which I would not, it, uh, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Look at this. What a maze this is. The more he fights this thing, it's like being caught in a snare. The harder you fight, the more you're trapped. And he's fighting. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. What's he finding out about himself? He's finding out he ain't perfect. That's what every Christian finds out when he chooses the course of the Spirit. You find out that you can do your best to keep the rules all your life and all it will do is compound the problems. It will not solve the problem. It will compound the problem. There is only one way to get out from under the oppression of the law, and that's to die. That's what the cross is all about. And a great, great verse to write right here tonight at the top of this chapter is Galatians 2.19. I, through the law, who's Paul saying that to? He's saying it to Peter in Jerusalem when Peter stopped eating pork because he compromised his Christian convictions in order to please his party. He did not have the guts to stand for truth. And he found out that the same streak of cowardice that made him deny Jesus Christ years before that, when he stood at the enemy's fire on the night uh, Christ was crucified, that he still had that streak of cowardice when he was the great apostle in the church years afterward. He was still as bright yellow on the inside under certain pressures as he was the night when he said to a little maid, I tell you with cursing and swearing, I do not know the man. And years later, his peers put pressure on him and he stopped eating pork because it was an offense to those uptight Christians from James' party when they came up to Antioch. And I should have said Paul said it to him in Antioch in Syria. And Paul said to him, if thou being a Jew lives, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, Peter, if you're living like a Gentile until these Jews come from James and they put pressure on you to revert into your old life patterns, he said, you do not have the guts to stand up for what's truth. He says, you're not living according to truth. Read Galatians 2 when you go home tonight. He said, if thou being a Jew livest like a Gentile, why are you now compelling these Gentiles if they want to continue to fellowship with you to live like Jews? We who are uh, Jews by nature are not sinners like these Gentiles. 
And then he goes on to say this, I, through the law, and this is the great verse you should put at the top of the chapter, Galatians 2.19, I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. The only thing the law ever does, when it really does its work, when God applies it, is to bring you right down to zilch. And when we are finally convinced that you can't trust the flesh, and that it's not going to please God to walk naturally and try to figure things out, then all of a sudden, like a flash from heaven or like a slow dawning, it's different in different lives, but God says, Christ is your life. And he starts living in and through us. Verse 24, after all the struggles, he gets to this. And he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. That's a good place to be. That's when we stop strutting our stuff. That's when we stop lying when somebody says, How are you? And a little by little you're able to speak the truth, at least to your mutuality friends, and to say to those who love and accept you as you are where you are, I hurt when you do hurt. Or I'm glad when you are glad. Or I'm mad when I am mad. And you're able to speak the truth in love, and you're able to accept the truth a little bit more. And Paul came to the place where he faced enough dragons to make him sick unto death. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am. You know how he started this? this sorry tale of a downward spiral into the center of his being, he started by fighting with one sin. You go home and read Romans 7. The one sin he fought with, it wasn't forgiveness, a lack of forgiveness. It was covetousness, the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. Paul's life, he found, was full of covetousness. He thought that was his sole problem, like the man in Sabinsville, Pennsylvania, who said, if I could get rid of the cigarette, I'd be a perfect man. Paul found out his problem wasn't covetousness. Paul's problem was Paul. You don't just have one sin one favorite sin, one sin that easily besets you. It's not these branches out here in this tree. We Christians go back to the grave, we dig up the old man as though he were a tree and try to paste good fruit on bad branches. Jesus said either make the tree good and the fruit will be good or make the tree evil and the fruit will be evil. A bitter fountain can't bring forth pure water. And so I died with whom? I become dead to the law by the body of Christ. When I reach Paul's place here in Romans 7:24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Who will ever find a way out for, the, for me? I'm at the end of this struggle. He's exhausted. And he cries out of the midst of his despair, Who will ever deliver me? And the minute he gets to the end of his rope, and he stops posturing, and playing posturing peacock games, and stops holding up his mask and his facade, and his fig leaves, and his status symbols, I am spiritual because I'm a keeper of the yardstick and says, this is the way I truly am, O oh, wretched man. There's only one kind of people in the kingdom, wretched people. Who will ever deliver me from this body of death? You know to do that? Your present mode of being dissolves. Your sense of self-worth through accomplishment and achievement comes crashing down. Your reputation probably gets dragged through the mud. You begin to be seen in your true life, people light as you really are. We're known for what we are, not what we pretend to be. And when we get to the end of that rope, Paul said, Oh, wretched man, who will deliver me from the body of this death? No sooner does he hit rock bottom, and it dawns on him in the dark night of the soul. I thank God through Jesus Christ. The very next verse, the words are, I thank God through Jesus Christ. With, a, with my mind, I serve the law of God. With my natural mind, I serve the law of sin. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And he comes to a realization. Christ is my life. I can't do anything but flop. I can't do anything but fail. But Jesus Christ lives within me. And for the first time in his life, he knows something of surrender instead of control, of trusting instead of trying. That's a new way. You have been listening to Dr. Bruce Morgan. We hope you've enjoyed this audio. If you would like to request more audios or learn more about our ministry, contact us at Eagles Vision, Post Office Box 3160, Cody, Wyoming, 82414 or visit us on the web at drbrucemorgan.com. Thank you.